Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'd Continuing on in our study regarding basic fiqh issues of tahara and purification and in beginning it's important to mention some of the ahadith pertinent to tahara because I prefer studying the fiqh of tahara and purification and salat from ahadith beginning with the hadith uh, عن أمير المؤمنين أبي حفص عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله تعالى عنه قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول إنما الأعمال بالنيات وإنما لكل امرئ منوى فمن كان هجته إلى الله ورسوله فهجته إلى الله ورسوله ومن كان هجته للدنيا يسيبها امرأة ينكحها فهجته إلى ما هجر إليه روه شيخان This is the hadith of Umar Amir al-Mu'mineen Abi Hafs radiallahu ta'ala anhu who said, I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say verily actions are tied to the intentions and everyone shall get that for which he intended therefore he who migrates for Allah and his Messenger then he is migrated for Allah and his Messenger and he who migrates to take some woman for some worldly gain or to take some woman in marriage then he will get that for which he migrated for in this hadith, this hadith is important for us because it shows us the importance of the intention and the intention as some of the fawaid of the hadith uh, illustrate and show us that the intention for all of our deeds in Islam they go back in order to have them accepted to two things the intention that it was done sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and secondly that it was done in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So one of the benefits of mentioning this with regards to tahara and purification is that all of our deeds uh, in Islam, they go back and they're measured by the niya, by the intention. Siha, fasadin, kimalan, wa naqsan, wa ta'a, wa ma'asiyah, fa man qasida bi amalihi riya atham. ومن قصد بالجهاد مثلا إعلى كلمات كلمات الله فقد فقد كما كما الثواب. so the intention our deeds are judged in accordance with our intention. that's one of the things we get from this hadith. whether our action or the deed that we're doing its correctness or its incorrectness. Its completeness, completeness, or its incompleteness, whether it's an act of obedience or whether it becomes an act of disobedience. So, for example, whoever does a deed in order to show off, then they will have, uh, they will gain a sin, even though they did a good, righteous deed. They gave sadaqa. They, they had a beautiful prayer, but they did it to please the people, to show off in front of the people. Then they will actually be, have done something sinful. And this all goes back to the intention. And likewise, the one who intends uh, jihad fi sabilillah to raise the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make it superior, only this alone, then they will get the full reward. And the one who intends that same action, but they want only war booty, the war spoils from it, or, or they want the war, the war booty along with that, then they will have less reward, but they'll still have reward. So the point being here, that in accordance with one's intention, their reward is also in accordance with their intention. And whether their action is correct or incorrect, and so on and so forth, as we already mentioned. Also, we learn from this hadith that the place of the intention is in the heart. So we make our intention when we're going to purify ourselves or when we're going to perform the prayer inside of our heart. It's not necessarily to speak on our tongues and say, I intend to make wudu, I intend to make salat. And the ulama of Islam say that this to love the uh, be, be niya, you know, to, to speak with the knee on the tongue is a bid'ah. 
Likewise, uh, this hadith shows us the importance of warning and being weary of riya and summa. You know, being uh, doing things to show off and doing things to be heard and praised by the people and to become famous. And for those uh, doing deeds, especially deeds of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, deeds of worship, uh, to become famous and showing off instead of doing them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as an act of ibadah. And that's what distinguishes it from being an ibadah to being something which can be sinful or something which can actually uh, be a act of uh, a regular act or a regular deed that we do. And what I mean by this, for example, the one who intends to make wudu in accordance with the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with the correct intention, they'll be rewarded for that and it will remove the sins. But the one who does that same action, but they have no intention, their intention is not to purify themselves for prayer, they, and their intention maybe is to wash their hands and just wash their face or what have you, or they just do it without even thinking, without being conscious, then they will, it will be something that's mubah. It will not be something that prepares you for the prayer and that you will be rewarded for, but rather it will be something which is permissible, which there's no sin for it, and there's no reward for it likewise. And there are many other fawai to this hadith, but we're studying this hadith for its importance with regarding to tahara, uh, tahara and salat. The next hadith on Abi Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu qala qala rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam la yaqbalullahu salata ahadukum idha akdata hatta yaqtawaddahu. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Allah does not accept the prayer of any one of you if he uh, makes hadith until he makes wudu. And hadith here is referring to the impurities. Impurities like passing gas at Kramak Malah or uh, urinating or uh, defecating. Uh, and those are the ways, those are some of the hadith al eskar those are the minor impurities. And so those are the type of impurities in which you must make wudu. And that's why Abu uh, the Prophet said, لا يقبل الله صلاة آدكم إذا أحدث إذا أحدث حتي يتوضعه You know that one of you, your prayer will not be accepted if he makes the hadith, and he's talking about hadith al eskar here, until you make wudu. And the reason we know it's hadith al eskar because he's saying wudu. But if it's hadith al akbar, if it's the major impurities, like for example a woman's menstruation, like sexual intercourse, like uh, uh, sexual intercourse, or a woman's menstruation, or postpartum bleeding, you know, a woman after having uh, birth, given birth, and so forth, the bleeding. If it's one of those major uh, hadith or impurities, then in that situation, it is mashroor and it is required to make a ghusl, that a person must make the ghusl. And we'll talk about that more in detail once we get into the fiqh of the, uh, uh, the details of the fiqh. What we gain from this hadith, one of the things is that uh, the salat of the muhdath, the one who who has these impurities is not accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until he purifies himself, regardless of whether it's hadith al akbar or hadith al askar. So, whether it's the minor or the major impurities, one's prayer is not accepted until they make wudu, or if it's the major hadith, until they make ghusl. Another benefit we gain from this hadith is that that hadith, this hadith, that it breaks your wudu, of course. And it makes your salat batil. So if the person, for example, here's a message that comes up. Sometimes a person is praying and they pass gas, or they're pretty sure that they pass gas. And they, some people, out of embarrassment, they continue the prayer until the end. Then they go make wudu, and then they make the prayer again, or what have you. But this is incorrect, and some of the ulama, they say this is even a playing with the deen, and some of them even describe that as, as such a, a, a grievous sin that they're playing with the deen that they've even made it a kufr. So the point being is that it shows us the importance that we should not be um, allow our shamefulness with the people 
deter us from obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That a person, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, La yaqbal Allah salatu ahadakum, hatta ida ahdata hatta yatawadu. That one of you, your prayer is not accepted if he makes this hadith. So if a person is in salat and they're sure that they don't have wudu or they broke their wudu, they must leave salat immediately. Regardless if they're in the imam of a thousand people, that they need to leave and make wudu. Very important. Because Allah doesn't accept that salat and that makes your salat batil invalid. Another benefit from this hadith is that this hadith, uh, this hadith shows us that tahara is a shart, the sihat to salat, that uh, tahara is our purification, is a condition for the correctness of salat. That's one of the conditions for the correctness of your prayer. Meaning that without it, your prayer is battle. It is the miftah of salat. It is the key to prayer. عن أبي عن عبد الله بن عامر بن عاص وأبي هريرة وعائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها عنهم قالوا قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ويل للعقاب من النار عبد الله بن عامر بن عاص وأبي هريرة وعائشة رضي الله تعالى عنهم أجمعين they said that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Wailu lil aqab min al nar Woe to the ankles from the fire. And the context here in this hadith is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, is warning against being lazy or being careless with regards to making wudu and not properly washing one's limbs. And with that, uh, letting us know that there's a stern punishment for the one who is uh, careless with regards to this. And this was in regards to uh, some Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala, and Mijma'in, who were making wudu, and then it was noticed that there was a spot on the ankle of one of them. So the Prophet وسلم, warned that. Woe to the ankles, meaning uh, woe to the ankles from the fire. You know, protect your ankles from the fire. It was a stern warning to let us know that you must be, uh, make a proper, uh, complete wudu. And that's one of the main benefits of this hadith is that it shows us and illustrates that it's an obligation to wash the limbs properly for wudu. That doesn't mean we should be wasteful of the water. And especially, it's a mention in the hadith, the ankle. Uh, or the the uh, the back part of the uh, the foot, because that's an easy place to miss. It's an easy place to become careless about. So we have to be careful uh, about this because this is a shart uh, of salat. This is a condition for salat, your purification. So we can't be careless with regards to this. Uh, it also shows us the obligation to wash the two feet uh, in wudu and that this is in accordance with the ijma of the ummah and the only ones who differ with regards to this is the Shia who go against the uh, the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and this was from the ta'aleem uh, of the Sahaba and we'll end there for now and we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil